SACPA acknowledges that this event takes place on the lands of the Blackfoot people and Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3, and we pay respect to their past, present, and future cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to the land. SACPA commits to assist reconciliation efforts by raising awareness of the ways past and present injustices can be reconciled. Our speaker today is Dr. Sharon Yannicki, speaking on the title, Shenla, Social Health Equity Network of Lethbridge and Area. She calls for collective action to address child and family poverty in Lethbridge and the area. Please join me in welcoming Sharon. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think I'll just put it right on top if it's going to be okay, or I can hold it. Thank you. So thanks very much uh, for inviting me to speak today. This is an important topic and we're delighted to have the opportunity um, for Shenla uh, to um, have um, the report um, disseminated a bit and um, so I'm really happy to represent Shenla today in, in presenting this information. Next slide. Do I do it? Here? Uh, is it arrows? Okay. There. So um, we're really, really pleased uh, to have the support of the United Way in working on this area uh, and this issue. Uh, child poverty is a very important issue to address, and I'm going to be talking about why that's an important thing. Um, but uh, it is great to be working with United Way on this issue. I also want to acknowledge that uh, the report was written by Help Seeker. And um, we, uh, Shenla, worked with Help Seeker in, frame, in framing the report and editing it. And we received funding from the City of Lethbridge and the Government of Canada. So, who is Shenla? Um, I'm not sure if you've heard of us, uh, but we are an umbrella organization and we're focused on promoting social health equity in Lethbridge and area. So our, our focus is not only on Lethbridge, but we, we, can, um, we look at all of southwestern Alberta communities. We're promoting collective impact. So what's that? Collective impact is um, people working together to address a common agenda, a common issue, and um, from many different uh, sectors of society to try and um, create change. The focus of the report, you'll see if you um, take a look at it, uh, is that uh, is on child, youth, and family poverty. Now, it's interesting to me that this is the first report in Lethbridge to focus on child poverty issues. Uh, we um, had a previous report on poverty, and the last one was um, completed by Vibrant Lethbridge in 2015. So that's a long time ago, and so we have a big gap that we fill with this report in terms of understanding what's happening with poverty in our community. But we also want to address what's happening to children so, and youth. So that's uh, a big issue that we are trying to um, explore in this, in this presentation and in the report. Um, you'll find the, uh, the, the press release on, on this report uh, posted on the website of United Way, and the report should be accessible there as well. So just to give you a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about, um, I'm going to try to answer these questions. So what is poverty? Why is child, why is child poverty an important issue? Uh, what are the impacts of child poverty? What are the rates in Lethbridge and area? Um, which groups are most affected that they have higher rates? And what action is needed? So 
So I've mentioned health equity, so I thought I'd just explain from Shenla's perspective what that means. Um, it, it involves individuals having fair opportunities, um, and in particular to reach their full potential. So when we're talking about children in this report, that's the way we're thinking about it. What are the barriers that happen related to poverty for barriers to reaching full potential as people? Um, health equity also means being able to meet your basic needs and to, and to live in dignity. Having opportunities to participate in society and be included in community life. Having opportunities to develop to your full potential. And that will include a uh, focus on early child development. So what is poverty? Um, if I asked you what was poverty, uh, some of you may think of um, absolute poverty, where you um, may be homeless or you lack food or you um, can't meet your basic needs. But it's much more than just absolute poverty we're talking about. It's about relational poverty. It's about um, being able to participate in community life. So it's, it's a much bigger idea. So in this report, we've focused on the social determinants of health. And those include things like income, education, employment, early child development, food security, housing, gender, culture, race, ethnicity, access to needed services of all types. So it's, it's a much bigger idea when you think about the kind of impact that poverty has on your life and the limitations it places on your life. So um, the United Nations called poverty fundamentally a denial of choices and opportunities and a violation of human dignity. It means lack of basic capacity to participate effectively in your society. It means not having enough, enough of any of the things that you need. It means insecurity, powerlessness, and social exclusion. So this is a much broader way of thinking about poverty. From an Indigenous perspective, which is also included in this report, poverty is being in a state of lacking wellness and holistic balance and the basic necessities and material goods that you need. So it's, it affects all of life, mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual. Now, we live in a country that has a plan to end poverty and we ha it's called Opportunity for All and it was implemented by the federal government. And because of this plan, the government regularly invests in policies that address poverty, like the child tax benefit, and it in involves um, uh, regular reporting. And so on the Government of, Web, uh, Government of Canada website, you can, you can Google Opportunity for All and you can find out what's happening in Canada on poverty. But you can't do that in the city of Lethbridge because we don't have a plan and we don't report on it regularly. So that a plan means uh, <coughs> taking action and doing and being able to account for what's working and what's not. So uh, government invention, intervention alone is not enough and that's why we're proposing collective impact and collective action because we need all three levels of government to work together on this issue to create change and we need broad participation and commitment from the community itself. So progress in Canada, when, we, when you look on the government website, you can see we've actually made some really good progress in addressing overall poverty. That's measuring all persons in Canada. And, and it's actually dropped from 2015 to 2020. Um, it's dropped 8.1%. And this doesn't happen without policies 
that are actually being effective and uh, making an impact. So this is really good news. Now the report that we have um, prepared doesn't have this, this level of data. We, we go up to 2019 in this report because we used census data from the previous census, 2016. That was all that was available at the time that this report was designed. And then you could get 2019 data from tax file and family file data that would tell us what's happening um, in, for families and for children. So our data doesn't go this far. And, um, but the new, um, the new census data is coming out this fall. And so a new report is needed to say what's happened in this interim. If poverty has dropped in Canada, we need to know what's happening in our city and when, in our communities. So that's why we're calling on this, the city to, to support regular reporting. So why is child poverty important? Before I tell you our data, I'm going to tell you why you, why you should really care. So child poverty is linked to a negative cascade of impacts across the whole life course for children. So it's not just an impact when they're young. It's not just when they're in school. It impacts health, well-being, and all sorts of other outcomes across the whole life course. So we should care that, that all of our children have opportunities, um, that they can develop to their full potential. And right now, that's not the case for many of our children. So thinking about, um, you'll see the list there of negative impacts. Um, may, maybe it's surprising that it infects, it also infects um, life expectancy and so statistically all of all sorts of things across health are impacted so I'm going to just tell you a few of the details on that. Children who live in poverty have a higher risk of mental, physical, emotional and behavioral health problems and that includes depression, obesity, child maltreatment and higher rates of addiction in adulthood. Lack of participation in community life neg negatively impacts early child development. It, it impacts school readiness, impacts school attendance, achievement, completion rates, and future employment. Living in child poverty uh, may experience, children may experience food insecurity that impacts mental health, including higher rates of risk of suicidal thoughts, mood disorders, and anxiety disorders. Child poverty may involve crowded housing. That might mean you're relocating to housing regularly, even changing schools regularly. This disrupts learning. Poverty is associated with higher rates of adverse child experiences, and that's also associated with higher rates of child apprehension and incarceration in adulthood. So at a community level, you're looking at income inequalities between groups and society are related with higher rates of addictions, higher crime rates, and a decrease in social cohesion. So that's the social cohesion part affects all of us because our society stops being willing to act, to share, to care about each other. So for Lethbridge, we need to care and we need to do something now because as, this, as we get bigger, this problem could get worse. Um, addressing child poverty can then prevent this whole negative cascade of impacts in that, and it also can prevent the cycle of poverty across generations. And so we need to care. Then there's the cost impacts. So if you're thinking about, okay, does this really impact me? It does when you think about the cost to society. Because we all live here and we all in Alberta are affected by these costs. So um, 
when we looked at and we were developing the report, we used data from a report in 2012 uh, that was created in the city of Calgary, and it estimated um, the rate then, and um, Help Seeker then estimated the the costs based on inflation, and so that rate is between 8.4 and 11.4 billion dollars across systems in society. That's, that's just huge. And so I can say to you, with confidence, it is cheaper to address poverty than to ignore it. Um, and we are proposing a collective impact approach, as I'd mentioned, um, and this is urgently needed because the, the impacts of poverty on children are unfair, unjust, and potentially preventable and modifiable. So we can't just do nothing. So here's some uh, data on overall poverty. And I wanted to, it's from the, um, the Lethbridge Census metropolitan area, so a little bit larger than Lethbridge. Um, and to just compare what happens to different family groups. So different family types, um, uh, no, this is low income, um, the percent change, sorry. So we can see um, that overall poverty has declined in a 10 year period, um, but in 2016, the overall poverty in Lethbridge was slightly below the national rate, but we don't know if that's the case now. This is good news, but we'll see in the next slide that child poverty rates are higher in, the, in comparison to overall child poverty rates in the community. So some groups are differentially impacted. And again, some of these rates are shockingly high. These, the data again is from 2019, or if it wasn't available from 2019, we use census data. But in, in 2019, 15% of children zero to 17 were living in poverty in Lethbridge CMA. And 47% of children in low income, in um, lone parent families were living in low income. When we look at Indigenous people, um, particularly First Nations children, 42%, um, 0 to 17 years of age, were living in low income in 2016. These are, these are immensely high, so we need to know, have we lowered these rates? Have the current social policy at the provincial and federal level for the child tax benefit lowered these rates or not? We need to know. Well, um, it's important that you know we 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 obtain the 2021 data and that we have commitment and support from the city for another report. So what about newcomers and, um, and people with disabilities in relation to poverty? What we could find was that 25% of people with disabilities live in low income. And that age rates um, have now been de-indexed for several years by the current government. And um, someone on age is only getting $1,685 a month to live on. It, it's just hard to quite imagine how they do that. Youth with disabilities aged 18 to 24 years accounted for 43% of CERB applications and recipients. So we know that people with disabilities were needing that extra help during the pandemic, but we need that picture of what's happened since the pandemic. For newcomers, the data uh, was only available for immigrants as a whole, and it didn't tell us what was happening with refugees and refugee children. Um, so we were able to find that 17.9% um, of recent immigrants 
who come to Canada and live in Lethbridge were um, in low income. <clears throat> There's more. <laughs> and this part isn't good news either. Um, poverty is racialized. So that if you are a member of a group um, who self-identifies as a racial, racial group member or who's designated um, using what the Statistics Canada calls visible minority groups, um, you have higher rates of, of poverty as well. So 2016 data told us 20.8% of people with racialized identities uh, were living in poverty. Um, and that's compared to 12.2% for non-racialized people. And poverty is gendered. So women-led lone parent families were more likely to live in core housing need. So not only were they living in poverty, but they were in, in need of housing. And um, that's 23% versus 17.8% uh, for male-led lone parent families. So big difference. Um, Harbour House. Uh, our report was, uh, I see I did missed um, a, a little typo. It should be 2020 to 2021 on uh, for YMC Harbour House emergency, emergency shelter use. So 238 women and 91 children were housed in that year but 884 people were turned away because they didn't have enough space. Shocking. When we look at um, the table, um, table seven from the report, uh, we're looking at a list of household types. And I'm sorry, this is a, a little bit complex to see what I, my point is here. But you'll see in purple, I've looked at comparing Lethbridge County and Crow's Nest Pass and the city of Lethbridge uh, in the center. And when, I, when you look down the list on the right, um, on the right-hand side, you'll see those are lone parent families in 20, 15, because that's the, the earliest data they had. Um, and the, so the difference between um, uh, parents, two parent families in the middle, and lone parent families on the right hand side is very significant. But when you, when you look at what's the income gap between, if you um, are looking at uh, the mean income on the, on the right and the lone parent families, uh, sorry, on the mean income on the, median income on the left and median income for lone parent families on the right. Um, then you see there's a big gap between what the households uh, for, for lone parent families are, are having. And so for lone parent families in Lethbridge, the gap was $14,055. Uh, in Crow's Nest Pass, it was $20,032. And in Lethbridge County, it's $25,000. So some, the income gap is wider in some uh, communities for parents that are in lone parent families living in different situations uh, across the pro um, southern Alberta. Here I wanted to share five minutes. Okay. <laughs> so I have, um, I'll give you this uh, slide and then I'm going to skip to um, the action that's needed. The, um, this slide is talking about living wage. And uh, Shenla and the United Way have been working with the Alberta Living Wage Network um, over the last year and we calculated the living wage in Lethbridge last year and we're um, coming close to um, the release of the data for um, the 2022 uh, living wage for Lethbridge and you can this you might not be able to see it clearly but living wage in Lethbridge was $19 an hour and 
Um, so that is higher. The cost of living um, was higher than um, would be supported by a minimum wage. And I can tell you that it has gone up. And that's no surprise because so many costs of living elements have gone up. So what action is needed? I wanted to highlight just the different groups who need to be involved in collective impact, the general public, regional and business sectors, service sectors, and the social safety net, um, parts of the social safety net, funders and decision makers, federal, provincial, and municipal government, and community partners. So I've got a few samples of what can you do. Uh, the report outlines uh, recommendations across all of these groups, and I've given a few samples, but um, there are more if you're interested in taking action. So for the general public, we're, we're hoping to, that you become more aware and that you'll advocate to elected representatives you will want to become an ally to those living in poverty and to racialized communities in your neighborhood and your res and other residents. Businesses, we're encouraging you to pay a living wage, uh, to a adopt diverse hiring practices that are inclusive of racialized people and people with disabilities and new immigrants. Service providers, um, that you review eligibility program uh, criteria for your programs and reduce barriers for people living in poverty. Uh, review services availability um, and address access issues in relation to the internet and computers and cell phones for people living in poverty because these cause barriers to access. Local funders and decision makers collaborate with partners to address um, exclusion, recognize diversity and promote inclusion and collective impact. The federal government needs to uh, work, develop a basic income plan, um, increase transfers to families living in low income, particularly uh, families um, uh, with children and a special focus on lone parent families. Provincially, we need to address age funding and index it to inflation. Uh, at, the, um, at the local level, we, need to, we also need to address uh, early child development at the provincial level, and all levels, levels of government need to address the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And finally, municipally, this is what we asked the City of Lethbridge to do. We asked them to collaborate on developing a plan to end poverty and set a date for um, trying to reduce that within 10 years. To promote collective action to end poverty and social inequities. To implement a living wage in the city and with all of their contractors. To engage and implement a social procurement plan and so that would also include all of the people doing contracting with the city. Um, implement municipal social policies and in particular a low-income bus pass. Transportation is a big issue for people living in poverty. So just to highlight at the end that um, the report that we've created is based on national reports and evidence-based strategies to end poverty in Canada. And so there's um, recommendations are across the board are, are evidence-based. That means they're associated with improved outcomes over time. And I've included some references at the end, and that's all. Next week's speaker and topic is Alona Sinchuk, and her topic is Escaping Ukrainian Ukraine During Putin's Special Military Operation. Please join us then.
And now I invite you to come forward. I see we already have a list of questionnaires for our speaker. Um, and I invite Dr. Sharon Yanke back to field these questions. Thank you. Okay, uh, Maria Fitzpatrick, and I don't know if my question's gonna be easy or not. Uh, in your final slide, you said uh, what you're asking of the city, and you gave them 10 years to come up with a plan. No, I, uh, two. Oh, yeah. Maybe I misunderstood, and I thought, why are you giving the city a pass? We need to do it right away. Good point. Okay, so point. that was my question. Um, yes, yeah, so we, we need a plan that will end poverty in a short period of time so that we would, we would effectively be taking action quickly so that we could measure um, a target date for ending poverty. And so thank you for, for that clarification question. Hey, Dr. Yanaki. Great presentation. Thank you. So what I've heard... Your name. Oh, my name is Alan Friesen. <clears throat> what I've heard you say is that poverty is basically a violence that affects us all. Even though we don't live in poverty, we live with poverty. We see people suffering and pain and, and sick and, and not getting enough to food and kids who can't go to school and be able to concentrate and get all they need. So and I know you said about from an individual perspective, we should lobby our local government to make a plan, get shit done here, and I'm 100%. What other things, like, because you said it wasn't just financial poverty it's relational poverty there's there's opportunity poverty right so what other things could caring individuals in our community do to assist to fill and backfill those those other deficits that's a great question Alan and I was thinking about that in relation to schools um, we used to have a making connections program that was in Lethbridge and that ended a little while ago from lack of funding, I understand. But that involved a lot of volunteers that worked with schools. And so uh, reach out to your schools and see if you can help kids who are struggling with reading or other things that volunteer with new immigrant youth that are struggling to learn. Um, all of these, we can, um, can kind of, we need advocacy, but we anybody could get involved. You could work at the library and, and as a volunteer. But more than that, we do need advocacy for policy changes that would actually implement strategies. And so we really do need you to call your, your elected officials and um, advocate. Thank you for your presentation, Sharon. Well done. Your name? My name is Bob Campbell. It's coming. <laughs> I, uh, just one quick question, and then a, a comment, and then another question. First question, you mentioned the funders of this uh, federal government and the city of Lethbridge, no provincial government, right? Did you apply to the provincial government? Secondly, you mentioned AISH needs to go up. We've been told over and over again that we have the highest rates in Canada. And that's why they've frozen it for the past seven years. And no one has ever asked, well, is it enough in the rest of Canada? But that's another question. So th there's that, that question. I guess the other question I have to you is, how can you convince political leaders, and civic leaders, that preventing poverty and eliminating poverty is going to save them money. Um, great questions, Bob. I'll, I'll begin first with saying that income is its a very um, evidence-based to say that income is the greatest determinant of health. And so what you don't do for people uh, in relation to income you pay for in health <laughs> and you you have costs that impact be, because people are in poorer health if you don't provide that support so consider um, what would happen to age what's the argument for age um, the government of canada has created um, a poverty line and we can as assess it by community and we can say, this is what it costs to live in a particular community. 
And so we should not be providing income supports that are half of a living wage, that are, that are less than what it costs to live in the community you live in. We, that information is very available, and why would our society accept that? So that's, that's my argument. And um, did I miss any part of your question, Bob? Okay, thanks. I should <clears throat> coming up after hi Sharon. I have a name, Henning Mundel. Uh, Shenla and their, this report that you're referring to, what is the process of getting that to all the potential stakeholders, right from the uh, government levels to the NGOs? and to the MLAs in our area and so on for Shenla. And then uh, sort of as a tag along, uh, while Shenla is producing this report and is advocating for poverty reduction, do you have another function and action plan in relation to contributing towards uh, uh, poverty reduction? Very good. So. That's a great question, thank you. Um, so right now, Shenla is just a network, uh, and it is not a society. It can't dire directly receive any funding to take, undertake um, initiatives. When, with a collective impact approach, the city of Lethbridge has been our, our backbone organization for collective impact. What that means is, in the community and social um, safety plan for the city, um, they, they, they indicated that they would support collective impact to address the social issues of this city. Um, so when we request assistance to, to do this work, um, we've had some support. The, the, we've had We've, we are members of a national organization to address poverty and at a provincial level and our membership pay fees are paid in part by the city of Lethbridge. So that's one level of support. Then to produce this report, they did the contract work with Help Seeker and that is a form of, an important form of support, but they did it with a grant that they received from the government of Canada. Um, so we need, we need skin in the game, as they would say. Um, how to do that? You, United Way is in the process of um, reviewing how they could become our fiscal agent so that they could uh, enable Shenla to apply for grants, and to um, receive funding support from the community. But right now, the United Way is willing to accept funding, directed funding to different purposes. So if you um, wanted to donate to United Way and said, I want this to address poverty in my community, they would accept your money and put it into an account for that purpose. Thank you, Sharon, for a very good report. And I saw online when you presented this report, I believe, to City Council fairly recently. Uh, number one. Your name. Oh, I'm sorry, Barb Phillips. What was the general feedback that you got from City Council? And additionally, we're just moving with City Council into budget dis deliberations for next year. Uh, they need skin in the game. Have you seen any evidence that they are going to put some dollars into addressing poverty uh, or not? Hey, great questions. Um, there were, our report was actually received very well and with interest uh, when we presented it. City council members had a variety of questions. They asked for asked me for some additional information. Um, they did um, individual city councillors um, 
express some support for different elements. So, but we didn't have any commitment made. All that happened after that um, presentation to the Standing Policy Committee was that they accepted the report and it was filed to City Council. But then it goes to City Council and they didn't discuss it. So we, we don't have a commitment specifically in response to this report yet. Hi, Sharon. My name is Laurie Schultz. Thank you very much for your uh, insightful presentation. Um, Sharon, on one of your slides, you noted that um, there had been a decrease to 8.1%. Uh, and you had indicated, so policies do work. And um, forgive me, but I'm not sure if that was a federal? Federal. OK. Could you elaborate on the specific policies that worked? Um, yes, and it's the child tax benefit that the federal government first implemented and then um, the provincial government also has had um, some a, a child uh, tax benefit and that has particularly helped to reduce poverty. But if we look at different family types, um, the family type that has decreased, that poverty has decreased in most is the family, the two-parent family with two children. And or that's the one we have statistically some data on. And we've seen um, lone parent um, poverty decrease slightly, but not nearly at the, the level of um, decrease that we've seen for, for two-parent families. So that's just, that's where the impact has been the greatest. And so that's why we're calling for policies that also address the other individuals. Now we also know that individual poverty is fairly significant as well, and not the focus of this report, but we do recognize that. Did that, did that address your question? That's okay. Hello, my name is Knut Peterson. Thanks very much, Sharon, for your presentation. My uh, question relates to universal guaranteed annual income. You touched upon it a little bit. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Have you done any study? Have you, can you give us a little more insight into that? Thank you. Yes, um, two years ago, Shenla developed a policy statement on basic income, and um, we viewed it in the context of Southern Alberta and recommended that um, that be implemented at a national level. So we have advocated for um, universal basic income for some time. Whether it's universal or a specific basic income plan, um, that's up to po politicians to decide which way it's implemented. But there, we've reviewed the evidence on it from pilot studies um, that took place in different parts of the country. There was um, one in Ontario and one in yeah, Manitoba, I think. Um, so though there's, there's good evidence that it um, enables people to um, live with dignity and have choice. Um, there was increased rates of people going back to school, of improving their um, ability to gain um, better employment, and that it had longer in term impacts from the, the pilot study. So basic income is not just about meeting your basic needs, it's being able to live in society and contribute. Leona Jacobs. Um, so you mentioned that you presented to City Council and um, they were very interested in some aspects. Some people were very interested in some aspects. And, but basically it was a thank you very much and went off the shelf, right? So <coughs> City Council faces um, the pragmatics of living in Lethbridge the streets, the plowing, the garbage pickup, whatever, right? Versus something that you're asking them to do that's very abstract. So what are the arguments that we can use with our counselors to say, this? here's a dot and here's a dot. 
and connect them for them? What are the arguments, the very tangible things that can be achieved when we reduce child poverty? Not mentioning what the federal government or the provincial government might offer, but what can, what are the, what's the benefit here that's very tangible for those people that argue about their tax dollars? Thank you, Leona. Great, great question. Um, so I'm going to talk about an example of implementing a living wage and what that means. Um, so we've, in, we've encouraged the city to consider implementing a living wage for all their employees and all their contractors. So right now you can, you can bet that the city employees are paid a living wage. At $19 an hour at the current living wage, Lori's telling me no. Now that is fascinating. I wouldn't have guessed that. It, it's the contractors that I thought would be most impacted by that policy. So um, when you think about the who cleans the city uh, buildings and uh, you know all the other kinds of suppliers of goods and services, if all of those people, um, those individuals who are working, got a living wage, that would lift not only the individual but their whole family out of poverty. And so um, when, when uh, Shenla first um, reported on the living wage last year, since then three Shenla member organizations have become living wage employers. And so the, the, the two food banks, uh, United Way and um, and Volunteer Lethbridge have all become living wage employers. They recognize that having their employees paid a living wage improves their ability to retain people, it improves their ability to access the, to, to, um, to, to be healthier. <laughs> and so statistically, living wage employers benefit from more stable workforce, and they don't spend as much on recruitment. They have employees that are more committed for, to them and who come to work healthier. And there, there's good statistics saying that it, it benefits employers on the long haul. And so it would benefit the city as an employer. It would benefit um, all uh, employers who choose to take that instead of, uh, you know, looking at the importance of a stable workforce is, is really of benefit. Yes, hi there, Sharon. Hi. My name's Melanie Healy, hi. and um, I live in Lethbridge, but I'm from the Blood Reserve. So I have a couple questions, and some of it, too, is like a little bit of a comment as well. <clears throat> I had to bring my book so I don't re forget everything. So you talk a lot about, you know, the different levels of government coming together to put together a plan on how we can work towards eliminating child poverty in our community of Lethbridge. <clears throat> and you said something about 10 years. Well, was that what you had projected? Um, we would like to end poverty within 10 years. Okay, all right. Well, first we have to take a look at how long has child poverty been a problem in our community? And is it realistic to say that that can be done within 10 years? Overall, it is super optimistic. And we have to also, we're kind of, I feel like we're getting a little bit off topic about talking about the child tax benefit and the universal benefit, which are all good incentives from the government. But really, we need to be getting down to the root of the problem. Mm -hmm. Why is there child poverty? Why does that exist? You know, we have to take a look also I mean, I hate to be the one to bring it up, but we got to take a look at discrimination. Mm -hmm. So the parents of those children, so we look at the parents of being our providers, right? So those parents, well, why are they struggling? Why can't they get jobs? And then because of that, then they go into poverty and they can't provide for those children. So we gotta be looking at the root of the problem instead of discussing way up here, you know. That's what I find a lot of like political issues, you know, are we're talking about kind of on a macro level, but we gotta be talking about like, what can we do for children right now? How can we change our attitudes towards those families that are being affected by poverty. For instance, you did say the indigenous you know, population has a high record. <clears throat> and I wanna say that um, I'm a proud, alone parent, 
and um, um, fortunately, I've been fortunate enough to not have to live in poverty. And I think a lot of that has to do with the higher levels of education. So for me, in my experience, like with um, seeing or seeing my families um, deal with poverty, it really has a lot to do with starting out with the education. So the more educated the parents are, the more higher levels of income and jobs that they can get, mm -hmm. and then that they're able to provide more for their children. So I guess my comment is, how can we work together as a community to start assessing our own attitudes towards poverty on a bigger level and how affecting that is affecting children? Because when we look at children, they're so innocent, they're so beautiful, and it doesn't matter if they're Indigenous or non-Indigenous. I think if we have any heart and soul within us, we really have to look at the bigger picture of that. So I just wanted to say that's kind of my question on what can we do as a community mm -hmm. on the grassroots level. And then I also want to say this is my first time coming to the Lethbridge Senior Center. And it's such a lovely place. And the food is so good. And so I just want to say thank you for having, having me and my son come here today. Thank you so, so much. thank you so much for that. This is a, a, just an excellent question, and um, poverty is multidimensional and it's relational. And and so when we have issues around racism and discrimination in our community, it's absolutely essential that that is addressed as a root cause. And I absolutely agree with that. Um, education is a key way out of poverty, and so. It begins in early childhood, assuring that early childhood development is supported. So we do need programs like Opa Kassen's work is, is um, really a, an important um, element of supporting early childhood development here in our city. We need the family center, but we need support for all children and across Southern Alberta as well. So um, we've asked that the government you know, kind of restore funding levels for early child development because um, when this current government came into um, into power, they reduced support by 25 percent for parenting and early child development support across the whole province. So it, that's why it's a key element in in our report. That's why supports for children in schools are absolutely essential so kids can stay in school, complete school, be ready for school, achieve better at school. All of those elements are, are important. But we can't forget that post-secondary education is important and we have has seen major cuts to post-secondary education and tuition fees have increased significantly. And so all of these things are a concern for children coming out of poverty trying to achieve uh, an education and it's getting harder. So we do need to change all of those social policies that that so many of them are at a provincial level, but at a local level, we need to support um, all of those elements as well. So we need our city to support early child development programs in our city and our communities as well. Hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. uh, Ellen Carter, and thank you also for your presentation. It was most uh, most informative. This is really kind of a methodology question and so often we see all the calculations about living wage but I'm assuming that or living uh, yeah living wage and I'm assuming that that's based on a 40-hour work week but we're seeing more and more people that are in very precarious work situations we see collective agreements where you know yeah the wages go up but the hours are being cut and people are not getting paid for I'm looking at the example in Ontario prep time for the education assistant so do any of these calculations take into account uh, the fact that people are in more and more precarious work situations? And I guess um, the annual basic income would account for that, but yes. is this living wage looking at those issues? Thank you. 
great question as well. Um, so the, the living wage um, includes a, a calculation based on, for, for a couple, assumes that two people are working. And of course, I mean, that's not always the case. We, in, um, in Canada, we've seen a major decline in the percentage of women working um, in, in, in employment. We've decreased significantly for women's employment. Um, so we know that women have been harder hit since COVID pandemic. Um, we, but yes, those those assumptions are embedded in the calculation. But we did decrease the number of hours worked slightly. Um, the um, lone parent is in the calculation for uh, a lone parent family. Um, we've we've also considered that they're working, um, but. It's all the other costs of living. If you're um, are are also embedded in there, and in Lethbridge, you need to earn a car. You ha you need a car in order to work shift hours and uh, off hours because you can't get there um, or you can't get home from your shift if you're working off hours. And so those things are built into the living wage calculation. Um, so that, that calculation will be released on the 14th of November is kind of the tentative date for that uh, press release and, and you'll hear me talking more if <laughs> anyone is interested when that information comes out. Um, is there any other element at that, did that address it? Um, okay, any other questions? I'm taking off my moderator hat. And I'm putting on my questioner hat. Oh, good. Your name? Thank My name is Bev Mundell Atherstone. <laughs> Thank you, Sharon. On, <clears throat> I have three questions. Okay. No, no, no. <laughs> on your chart, you had low income. I would like to know what, what uh, exact number, number that is mm -hmm. for the low income. Um, did you know that if a person on age is is working and they're encouraged to work, if they miss bringing in a pay slip, then two things happen. Their age funds are immediately stopped and their, their drugs, their medications are immediately stopped. Now for people on, who have mental health issues, this is a slippery slope if you stop their medications right then and there. What is our government thinking? And the third thing is, God, can I read this? Can I answer them once at a, one at a time? Okay. So I remember? <laughs> okay, come to, come to the mic. So, quick recap of your question. Just the first one was low income. Low income. Okay, so the low income measure in Canada is a relative measure based on the market basket. Um, so, the cost of living in a particular community. And so, when they report it, they're reporting kind of an, an average of the market basket measure in that um, across Canada. But there is no, you know, kind of set number because it'll differ <coughs> by different community size and the cost of living. Um, and so when we were figuring out the cost of living in, in Lethbridge, uh, it may surprise you to know that we have the highest electricity costs and the highest food costs of any city in, in Alberta. Um, so these are the things that pop up as you start doing the calculations in that way. So that's that's kind of why there can't, it's a relative number. So approximately? Um, you know, they don't, they've only calculated for the biggest cities in Canada and they haven't got down to our city size. <laughs> so I'd, um, I haven't got that number. <laughs> Okay, this, the second question was rhetorical. The third question is, in relation to poverty, um, what, what in, in your research is the difference between being in that low, that poverty group, that low income group, and being homeless? I, again, I can't put a number on it, but I, I imagine that we have a lot of people in our community who 
are, you know, I've heard nationally people saying that, you know, many people in Canada are one paycheck away from being homeless mm -hmm. and because they live, you know, month to month. And so that level of insecurity creates a lot of anxiety for people. And um, the report of the homeless count hasn't come up. Um, it's not been released yet, but early numbers um, that I heard uh, at the report was that homelessness has really increased in Lethbridge. Um, so about four times the number homeless of, as in comparison to shelter beds. Now I put my moderator hat back on. And thank you. And wonder, do you have um, something you would like to leave our audience with, both our audience here and at home, as either an action or a suggestion? Um, great. Um, I would urge everyone to find a way to contribute to action on this issue. Whether it's talking to your um, an elected official, a city councillor, or think about joining Shemla as a community member, because we're just a network. We're open to anyone to join who wants to work on collective action. We, when we get organized uh, with the United Way and start holding consultations in the community, I would encourage you to come out. When we are, you know, talking to people um, in low income and consulting them and trying to um, encourage people with a lived experience of poverty to talk to us, and we want to share that information. If if you uh, live in a low income or know someone who does that would like to share their experience, help us find them, and and we'd like to to share those stories. Join me in thanking our speaker. Knud reminded me that I made a mistake. Next week is Trevor Harrison, and his talk is How Daniel Smith Became Premier and What It Means for Alberta. See you next week.